Hi! So today in this module we're moving away from standardized assessments and we're really moving into more of our classroom assessment portion of the class. And we're going to really focus um, this module on formative assessment. So hopefully take a little breather from that really heavy quantitative stuff and really think about um, the ways in which what we're talking about in class can really impact our classroom and what we're doing with our own K-12 students. So formative assessments. So what is formative assessment, guys? Hopefully this is something you've talked a lot about in your methods classes, in your field one class, and what you have been doing a lot of, right? So formative assessment is um, the gathering of evidence of student learning. I mean, this is key. Formative assessment really involves providing feedback to a student and then adjusting those instructional um, strategies. So we're thinking about that gathering of evidence, providing feedback, and then adjusting instructional strategies here. So here is a long list of types of formative feedback. Don't worry, we're not talking about all of them today, but I do want to highlight some really key pieces of formative assessment, some key ways in which you might be using formative assessment in your classrooms, and when and where you might use each of these separately. So questioning. This is probably the most basic kind of formative assessment, the types of things that we kind of do naturally as teachers, but also why we have to plan it out really carefully. I know in your lesson plans, some of you might be annoyed because you're a your professors or your field instructors might say, well, write down the questions you're going to ask. And you're like, come on, right? Why do I have to write these down? But really and truly, good questioning is an art. It takes planning. It takes time to think about what are good, appropriate questions to ask, right? So we want to think about the levels of difficulty and complexity and higher order thinking skills. I know that if I just ask questions off the top of my head, they tend to be really knowledge level, basic questions of students. And that's why, as you notice, a lot of my PowerPoint slides have questions already written on them. That's why remember to ask those higher order thinking level questions. Um, the other thing about questioning is it's really easy to differentiate in this way. So if I ask some easier basic level questions, I can target those to my students that are that I know can answer. And then I can save those higher, more difficult questions for the students I know that I can engage at a higher level in my discussion. Um, when I say wait time, what does that mean? Yeah, it's really hard, right? Wait time is really difficult. Uh, it's really difficult when I'm speaking into a microphone and not to an actual class, right? I'm trying to like wait for an imaginary class, which is even weirder, trust me. But even when I have real students in front of me, wait time is difficult, right? I wanna wait and make sure I'm giving everyone a chance to think of the answer. Um, because oftentimes I even wanna wait before I have students raise their hand. Because what happens as soon as one student raises their hand, all the other students stop thinking, right? And then once I call on someone, I want to wait and give them a chance to answer, right? Yeah, so wait time. That can be difficult. Um, there's another way to kind of make sure that I'm, I'm getting all of my class involved, right? So what happens a lot of times is that one or two or three students are dominating the class conversation. So I can use popsicle sticks with students' names written on them to kind of make sure that I'm randomly selecting from the class, making sure everyone gets an opportunity to answer. Um, other teachers have more technological ways to call on random students, right? Um, or they can check off in their grade book who's answered questions. Um, another thing that is maybe a little bit low tech and a little bit easier for me anyways is to divide the class into quadrants and to just try to pick someone from each quadrant every time I ask a question and kind of rotate around the room. That's a little bit easier for me in that um, I like to have a little bit more control over who's answering. Um, it, the popsicle thing never really worked for me, but I've definitely seen it work for other teachers. So you as a, as a teacher, as a professional, maybe have to decide the best way to get questioning of all of your students to work best for you. Okay, some other tips for question, effective questioning. Um, make sure the questions stated clearly. I know some of you have been the experience where you've asked a question and everyone's kind of giving you a blank stare, like, what did she mean by that, right? So make sure your question's clear. Sometimes you have to restate. Um, match, oh, excuse me, match questions to the learning target. So make sure that you're asking questions that are relevant to the types of things that you want to make sure you your students know. Involve the entire class. Um, that wait time is really important. And make sure that you practice giving the appropriate response. So um, I think the most difficult thing is when a, when a student answers a question with an incorrect response, what do you do, right? Um, 
so when I was um, observing at a school one time, and they were over like um, child-centered instruction, kind of constructivist approach, and anyway, the students would um, be giving answers to math problems, and they never got around to telling kids the answers were wrong. So the kids were kind of under this impression that there were like five or six or seven answers to every math problem, right? So that's not the right approach, right? We actually do need to tell students that there are correct and incorrect answers to problems. So we need to do that in a way that doesn't hurt their self-esteem, that they're still going to be willing to challenge themselves to take risks to participate in the classroom environment. So you have to kind of figure out the best way to do that. Sometimes you might say, well, you know, let's think about that again, or does someone else have another idea, or how can we... Does anyone else have a way in which they could solve that problem? Um, <clears throat> and another way to do that is to, av to avoid yes or no questions. If you really want to have a discussion base, you want to think about um, asking questions that can spark that discussion. You can also avoid that inappropriate response if you, um, if you don't ask questions you already know the answer to. Um, this works well for discipline too. So if um, you watch you know, Sally throw a rock and you say, Sally, did you just throw that rock? I mean, she has two options, right? She can either admit to throwing the rock or she can lie to you. She already knew she'd throw the rock, so don't ask her if she threw the rock. Instead, say, Sally, why did you throw the rock? You don't know why she threw it, right? So same thing. You don't have to say, um, what's the answer to 2 plus 2? But you can say, how do you solve this problem? Now they're talking about their solution to the problem. That's something you don't know. And it helps you identify maybe where they went wrong. Um, avoid leading questions. So avoid kind of saying, if you already know the answer and you're trying to get them to a specific answer, a lot of times that kind of leads into disaster because the students can't read your mind. Fun fact, you know, I've tried it for millions of years. I have never once been successful at getting students to read my mind. It's crazy. Um, and then asking questions in an appropriate sequence. You want to um, you want to think about leading, um, asking questions so that you're maybe progressing on an idea, starting with basic concepts and leading to more complex concepts. And the next one is discussion. And um, when I used to teach the lesson planning course, my students would oftentimes write discussion as one of their, uh, their topics or their activities in the lesson. And I was like, okay, well, it's not that easy, guys, right? And how many of you guys have tried to lead a discussion in your class, right? It's, um, it's not as easy as just saying, okay, well, now we're going to discuss, right? It's, there's a real art to getting students to participate in the discussion and to making sure that you can effectively get all of your students to do this, right? And even with college students, I know, especially if I have a class of more than maybe 10 or 15 students, making sure that everyone's actively engaged in that discussion can be difficult, much less if I'm in a high school class with, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 students, right? So how do we do this well? And one way is to do what we call a fishbowl, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen this done in the classroom, but it's where you have a smaller group of students in an inside circle, maybe five to ten students, and then everyone else is on the outside of the circle. And that smaller group of students is having the discussion, and the larger group of students on the outside is observing. Maybe they're writing questions for the inner circle, or they're taking notes on that discussion. So they're observing the discussion in that smaller group, is participating and then they rotate out so that everyone has a chance to be in the middle of that fishbowl. Um, the Socratic method is another um, well-established way to do discussions and that's a way in which um, the teacher poses questions to the group to lead them to an answer. Um, and then the 5E inquiry approach is another guided discussion method. I'm not going to go into the 5E approach here but um, for my elementary majors, um, you should be talking about the 5E approach when you do science methods. Also, my science ed majors, or my middle grades math and science people should know about the 5E approach, but essentially it's a way to spark inquiry into the scientific approach. Um, and discussions are really good about developing those higher order thinking skills, asking students to pick a side, and um, defend that side to think about answers and critical thinking skills about topics, right? So discussions are really powerful, but you as a teacher have to really think about how you're going to lead students, how you're going to make sure that all the class is participating, and that everyone's engaged. Mm, so, 
exit slips are, um, I think, my students um, go to when we talk about formative assessment, right? Everyone's like, well, we'll use exit slips. But let's talk about how to use exit slips effectively, right? So exit slips um, are short assessments at the end of class that students do, and it's kind of like their ticket out of class, right? They turn them in at the end. Um, they should take, you know, between five and ten minutes to complete. Um, I like to use them as a reflective piece. So oftentimes I'll ask in an exit slip, um, what did you learn and what do you still have questions about or what do you not understand? What do you understand? What do you not understand? And that really forces students to start thinking about articulating what they understand. If they get into the habit of that reflection, then as the lessons go on, they're already thinking about reflecting on what they know. I find that maybe even a little bit more powerful in asking them a simple recall or quiz type question. Um, we can also flip that around and make them admit slips at the beginning of class. They could be kind of like a bell ringer activity versus an activity at the end of class. Um, and the idea is that they're very short. They shouldn't take a lot of time. Um, we can also kind of modify this for early childhood. So for if you're teaching those little ones who can't read or write yet or who might have difficulty with that, we ought to do something similar to an exit slip when we ask kids to, you know, line up by completing a certain activity. Like, um, um, in order to line up today, I want you to think of a word that rhymes with the word book. Just be careful with uh, which words you pick for rhyming, right? Sometimes that ends poorly. <laughs> um, again, no more than five to 10 minutes. And again, if it can address some deep understandings or reflections concepts in the lessons rather than that surface level, you're doing even better. Um, learning and response logs, these are like journal entries. Um, a few years ago, D Duval County was all about these learning logs and then they kind of fell out of favor. But the idea is that um, students respond to some sort of journal response log in their journals and um, to record the learning process. And then the teacher has an opportunity to respond to each one of those individually back. So advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantage is that you have an opportunity to have discourse with each of your students back and forth on these journal logs. Um, the downside is that you're having discourse with every single one of your students. So if you have 200 students, that's 200 logs to respond to. You know, um, most teachers don't use them every single day, but maybe once a week you can develop a plan to do that. It can be really powerful learning, especially in content areas that you don't typically have discourse about. So asking students to write about what they're learning in math or what they're learning in science can be particularly powerful. You can also use it to um, set goals for their learning and that can also be particularly powerful. Okay, um, uh, graphic organizers are a favorite of mine for formative assessments um, because they really allow students to think and organize what they're learning. It really requires them to synthesize their learning and organize, huh, graphic organizers organize what they know in a way that's not quite so heavily dependent upon language. So it's a really easy access for students with learning disabilities and for English language learners to access those deeper thinking skills. Um, so we'll talk about a few, you know, a Venn diagram, right? It's the two circles that helps us compare and contrast. Um, a mind or concept map is like a bubble map that helps us um, outline what we know. And we'll talk more about that um, in the next lecture. Um, a KWL chart is just three columns. What I know, what I want to know, and then at the end of the lesson you do what I learned. Um, a PMI chart is three columns. Um, I usually use this in connection to a lesson or to a reading, and it's a plus, a minus, and an interesting. So if I'm reading about a topic, I can say, what are the pluses about this topic? What are the minuses? And then what did I find that was interesting? A T-chart can be used for a variety of things. It's two columns. We could do plus, minus, pro, con. We could do words and definitions. We could do people and their inventions. We could do um, simple machines and their purpose. You know, you can think of a long list of ways to use a t-chart. Um, a tree chart is um, like if we're doing a family tree and um, we can also use it to do things that are hierarchical in nature. So animal kingdoms, um, we could use it to anything that has um, a hierarchy and um, we can use with a tree chart. And then a flow chart tells us the order of things. So we use this maybe in the lang English language arts if we're writing a how-to paper or if we're showing um, the events in a story or a plot, um, or in science, maybe if we're showing the parts of a scientific method, 
um, or in history, the order of events in, a his in history, or even in math, how the steps to solving a problem. And then sometimes what I like to do is, after I've introduced to quite a few graphic organizers, is I like to tell my students now, we've learned about lots of these, I want you to think about which type of graphic organizer might be best for you to represent your knowledge about this topic. And you might see the different ways in which students have organized their own thinking. Um, the thinking maps, I'm not going to go through what, which you, which, <laughs> what all of these are, um, but know that this is a training that's given to teachers, and it's really powerful for helping students think and organize their thoughts. So if you're ever in a school that does thinking maps training, I highly recommend it. It's amazing. Um, another way that we can do formative assessments is through visual representations. And so this is just asking students to draw what they know or draw a definition. Um, so a mind map is similar to a concept map, except in addition to words, they draw pictures. Um, I really like to use visual representations for vocabulary words. So rather than saying write out the definition, which, you know, the students just copy from the textbook, I would say draw a picture of a construct or draw a picture of, um, you know, errors in measurement or validity or reliability, right? And then really students really have to think about what does this word mean and put it in a different context. So it's really stretching their brains and making them think about the meaning of words. And so you can see these pictures here on the side. These are my daughter Lily's drawings when she was in kindergarten of um, a turkey and a pilgrim and a Native American. Um, kinesthetic assessments are getting students to move around and um, show what they know through body movements and so um, this is really helpful to engage students in thinking um, you know we can have students um, draw a coordinate grid on your in your classroom and have them move to different points in that grid um, or demonstrating rotation and revolution of the earth around the sun and the moon finding different points of the compass and directions. Um, there's lots of ways I know that you guys have seen in classrooms where students have used kinesthetic assessments. Um, individual write whiteboards, that's where everyone gets their own whiteboard to write on. Um, have you seen these used in your classroom? So um, it's great. Kids, um, for whatever reason, love to write on, write, write on whiteboards. Um, it can be something that's really engaging for students and it's great because teachers immediately can see student responses. Everyone gets to respond at the same time, so I get to see everyone's answers and get that immediate feedback um, without even calling out any one person. Um, homework. So homework is probably one of those really, really classic formative assessments, right? We've all grew up with homework. Um, why do we have homework? We use it, right? Because it's a time for individual practice. Um, the, Oh, excuse me, the research on homework is really mixed, however, right? There's not a lot of evidence that supports the use of homework for um, student learning. In fact, um, especially in early elementary school and even late elementary school, there's just not a lot of evidence that shows that homework helps. Um, so, you know, and as a parent, not a big fan. You have my kid for eight hours a day. Why do you need even more hours? What are you doing all day that you need more time with my kid for, in order for them to learn things? That being said, extra practice we do know helps kids. So for sure, having kids read more at home, definitely a plus, especially if it's reading things that they are already engaged in, reading things of interest. Um, and then by the time kids get into high school, developing those study skills to help them be prepared for college is also beneficial. And by the time you're in middle school and high school and you're only seeing the students for, you know, an hour, an hour and a half every other day or 45 minutes every day, you probably do need additional time for them to practice the skills that you're teaching them. Um, but knowing that if it's individual practice, that that level of skill is probably not the same for every student. So every student probably shouldn't be getting the same homework assignments. You really want to think about differentiating that homework, thinking about what is that independent skill level, that zone of proximal development for each of your students, and making sure that that homework level is appropriate for each kid, right? Okay, quizzes. So certainly quizzes, another really classic way of formative assessment. Quizzes are probably the most predictive um, way to um, formally, formatively assess students for those summative assessments, right? A quiz is pretty much a mini test. It's probably going to give us really good information about what, what, how a student's going to do on that final exam, right? Um, so it's a great way to predict. Um, but um, again, not always students' favorite. Um, I'm going to make uh, say 
statement here, right, that I do not believe in pop quizzes, right? We talked about fairness and assessments, um, that when we give a pop quiz and students aren't prepared for it, we don't know how well they would have done if they had been prepared. So, and I think pop quizzes are too often given as punishment for students, and we don't want to use assessment as punishment, right? You know how in my class assessments are called celebrations? It's because I'm trying to alleviate the anxiety associated with assessments, not increase it by making it a punishment. So instead, if you want to make sure kids are doing their reading, give them regular quizzes. So if they know there's going to be a quiz every Monday, then they'll be prepared for that quiz, and you're still holding them accountable for doing that reading or for studying for those quizzes, right? Um, an alternative to quizzes is what we call a constructive quiz. And in a constructive quiz, you're having the students record their answers twice, whether that's on two different sheets of paper or using carbon paper. Um, and that way, they can hand back one set of quizzes that you grade, and they keep one set of their answers and get immediate feedback. So that way they're not learning misconceptions and you're able to give them feedback immediately on what they got wrong and what they got right so they can move on from that quiz. So sometimes those constructive quizzes can be really beneficial when you need to move on from a concept really quickly. Um, for younger students, um, we um, it's really difficult for them to record those answers twice, but maybe you're less concerned about cheating, so you might be able to do this by just having them switch colors of pen. I'm um, a four corners activity. Um, this is where you have each of your four corners of your classroom being labeled, so those might be strongly agree, strongly disagree, and disagree, and you might have statements that say things like, you know, um, I believe that Charlotte is a good friend, right, if you're reading Charlotte's Web. Um, or you could have them labeled A, B, C, and D and have different multiple choice questions from the FSA and you have students gather on which um, answer choice they think it is. Now, there's some sort of peer relationships happening there, right? So, um, on, especially on that second one with the answer choices, if everyone's going to answer B, I'm probably going to go with the class and not really answer A if I, unless I feel really strongly about it, right? Um, think, pair, share is one of my favorite techniques for formative assessment, especially when I have either a really chatty class or a class where I have some really shy students who don't participate. So um, in a think, pair, share, I ask a question and I have everyone spend a moment or a minute thinking about the correct answer. And then I have them share with their partner. Sometimes I go knee to knee, so they're sharing really quietly with the person next to them, or sometimes in a small group, sometimes three or four people. And then I have one person from each group share out to the whole class, or sometimes I only I don't have every group share, just a selection of groups to share. That way everyone gets a chance to, we have a little short discussion, but everyone got a chance to share some sort of answer and everyone is engaged and participates. Um, okay, so those are different examples of formative assessment. And remember, the key thing with formative assessment is that I'm really providing feedback to my students and I'm um, and I'm using that to plan my instruction. So coming up this week, um, you're going to have your instrument that you're going to develop, and we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Bye!